Yes, you are. Yeah, I, well, are we? I can hear myself in my headphones. I can hear me. I'm only coming through one year, but the other year's deaf anyway. Rory Underwood, absolute pleasure. I really appreciate your time. Hello. Um, so, you haven't got a clue who I am. <laughs> I obviously know who you are. Uh, I, uh, I, I explained a bit off air about what the podcast is and why I started it. Yeah. Um, I've got a real interest at the moment in, from, for various reasons, in, uh, in the, the similarities between transitioning out of the military, uh, and this is something I just didn't think about the last day in the build up to this. Yep. Transitioning out of the military and going from, from that military into Civvy Street and that sort of culture shock, depending yep. on how long you've been in for, and highly functioning sports personalities or sports people, maybe not personalities, going from that environment into city street yeah yeah no longer i think there's right or wrong i think there's there's quite similar uh, uh lessons to be learned and experiences to be had between those people going in that culture shock yep. element you've obviously done both one of the things i didn't realize is you is how long you was you only when you left the raf you didn't leave the raf until end of the tw- like 99 2001 2001 was it yeah and you and you uh, the thing is i i this june I've done as much out as I did in. So I did 18 years, I've just done 18 years out. Pull that across for me. Um, and just done 18 years in. So that's, a lot of people didn't realise how much I did. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's quite, it's quite interesting. People, when you first sign, people sometimes find it strange that you, uh, you sign up for 18. I mean, I was a full commission for me when I joined. I was a pilot. As far as I was concerned, I wanted to be a pilot. And they, some people can't get their head around. You actually signed on for 18 years. From the start, you did that? Yeah. Man, not many, the only people I ever knew did that was the Fijians in the British Army. Because they never, they never wanted to go back. Well, you're probably too young. But in my time, you either had a permanent commission or a short service commission. And I always wanted to fly. So, I, 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 you know, part of it was you get a pension at the end of, 30, you know, when you get 38 or even 16 years. Uh, but that's what I wanted to do. And I'll tell you what, the 18 years just flew by. Really? Mm. Just, sorry, pull this up for me. It needs to be in front, in front of your mouth. There you go. Perfect. Um, yeah, I suppose it's different than the RAF. I think with the military, it was like when I joined, it was a three year, three year contract minimum. But the, I think, and that was obviously it's a ranker. Yeah. So what was it with what was it with, with officers then in the RAF? Minimum nine years. Uh, well, twelve with option to leave after nine if for air crew. So it depended. If you were um, engineering or uh, regiment, then obviously that that, that differed. Every uh, long term was 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 the same, but uh, the short service was dif- differed. Bear in mind, you see. It's four years of training to be a pilot. You know, it's it's millions of pounds you're spending to train me to be uh, a pilot. So they've got to get some sort of kickback from it. Hence why it's it's longer for uh, for air crew. Yeah, that's a good point. It's a good point. And think of that. And when you for, when you first started playing, when did you first go pro- turn professional rugby? Uh, Ninety-five. So uh, I can see your brain's taking but, over. Yeah, I'm, I, you're going to make a math joke then, aren't you? <laughs> So how far into your career were you? Then? Right, so, I mean, so... Was that Tigers? Uh, well, yeah, but... So, if you get, so I first played for England in 84. Okay. But I didn't turn professionals to 95. Oh, it was different back then, wasn't it? It was proper. So, yeah, that's why I could see your brain proper, thinking over. Yeah. I forgot so, these times. Yeah, I... I ha- well, half the time that I, when I chat to people about it and try to explain, especially for people that sort of... You just see the game as professional now. And that's all you see. I've forgotten that completely. So... The best way, I, mean, I have to describe to people, there's, there's two things I say. There's one that's saying, uh, you've got to think that my job was flying jets in the Royal Air Force. My hobby was playing rugby. That's, and to sort of, to sort of give that as an example, I played in the World Cup final in 91 at Twickenham against, uh, against uh, Australia. Uh, and at eight o'clock on Monday morning, I was back at Met Brief at RF Witten to go, because I'd been away for six weeks. So I was back at Witten, back at Met Brief, to go get checked out again and be ready to go flying again. <laughs> What was the attitude like with with letting you go off and do your rugby at the time? Then? Uh, no problem at all. No problem. No problem. I mean, you know, the whole world was a different world back then. You know, army was a bigger place than navy. You know, now we're a flying club, a fishing fleet, and a you know, a, a platoon sort of thing. You know, we're all shrunk. Uh, you know, the air force is now thirty seven and a half thousand. I think it's supposed Did to it be. Really? Yeah. And when I left, I think it was seventy five. So it's it's shrunk rapidly. Um, so when I first joined. Um, you know, Wednesday afternoons was sports day in the military. It was still like that. You know, Wednesday afternoon, uh, everybody sort of went off, played sport or um, played in station rugby. Was always on the thing. I never played station rugby that much um, for obvious reasons. But um, 
uh, the Air Force are very good. The Air Force offered picked up fairly early that I was a, a rugby player. I mean, I I literally joined. I was four days before my twentieth uh, birthday when I got I graduated out of uh, Cranwell, and I'd I'd been on England trial. I played for county level Yorkshire County and stuff like England B, I think it was. So I hadn't played for England, but the Air Force took me on and uh, started flying training. So I went through Cranwell in '83. Finished that, went flying training in 83, and then literally while I was still on the Jet Province trying to learn basic flying training, I got picked to play for England February 84. So obviously, yeah, it all kicked off. I mean, I'll tell you stories about that when you've got ask stories about it, but, um, you know, it was uh, it was a fascinating time, but the Air Force were, were great. The Air Force, uh, I mean, it's like anything else. I don't know what your time period was. How long ago were, were you in? 21st century, 2000. So when you, when you first played for England, 85? Yeah. yeah I was four. Yeah, so you still, you, you, <laughs> yeah, so you obviously had a difficult paper round. Yeah, um, so the uh, so um, the air force was, was they they really looked after me. You know, they there were there were a couple of um, people in the in the senior sort of ranks who were, were on the committee, uh, the you know the RFU committee, the famous old farts, and uh, so Mike Steer and Mike Knight. They, uh, I mean, I know them very well, um, and. Uh, when you when you speak to them later on, you find out some of the things going on. I have been to people around and says, "Oh, I used to be at uh, uh, Innsworth and looking after your, um, uh, you know, the postings and various things." And they used to see my sort of reports coming through. I mean, most people would have, you know, a uh, first reporting officer, second reporting officer, and possibly send another one. I had about five on me because it would get sent to the higher beings to make sure that they were checking up, not checking up, but checking that everything was all right. Um, and uh, so having that, you know high level support obviously made a difference. I wasn't aware of it at the time. It was just, you know, I was just young free and single and just enjoying playing rugby and, and flying jets. So um but once been known to me, they they just paved the ways, made sure the bosses knew what they had coming towards them. And and most of the time when I was in the Air Force, they they basically it was once I joined my first squadron at three sixty, they had a we had a, a rolling six month program on the on the on the in the ops room. And uh my flight commander just looked just Put off the rugby you need to guess all my air force games any representative games because in those days all games were played saturday afternoon for the tigers so i i you know unless i was on detachment you know we the other few detachments um flying away most of the time i didn't so um yeah it was easy and the only times it really impacted me was when it was um uh tours and we can talk about some of that later on if you want mm-hmm. to but um so i just blocked off um you know uh the couple of days here the couple of days there as to when I was away playing for the Air Force or, um, you know, if I was playing for England, it was always the Thursday, Friday. Um, and then I just planned around it. So I just I just flew in between those days. And, it, you know, sometimes people think, you know, I, some people thinking that I basically was away um, February, March every year because of the five nations. I used to see, they see me in the four games. Mm-hmm. They just assumed I was away on, on camp with England for um five six weeks what was the reality um well i was well, in those days they played um every two weeks so the five nations were spread and it was played every two weeks ah so you played for england then you came back and played for your club then you played for england and obviously it's five nations so you always had one weekend off so then you'd play three games in a row and then you went to play for england play for your club play for england. so it was, it was you know you flip-flopped um so the standard thing was in the early days it was Thursday Friday. So I my, my first camp I I, I um, uh, had to go to tra- so I was told on Sunday night I had to be at Stourbridge Rugby Club on Monday night. I knew some of the guys but not everybody, and then I had to report to uh, the Petersham Hotel at Richmond lunchtime Thursday. Train Thursday afternoon. Train Friday morning. Played Ireland on Saturday. Different. And so that, that that sort of that sort of carried on. So play the match big dinner Saturday and Sunday morning drove back and then went flying again on the on the Monday and when I first got picked play for me I was in the middle of flying training so I was learning to be a baby budgie so yeah, anybody going through your basic training of whether it's basic uh, military training or going through your um, you know your uh, uh, actual skill training you know what it's like yeah we just off, so off topic but sort of not with the, with the Hawks were yeah. they a f- were they what was their role back then? The Hawks are a trainer. They Prime, were training back then as well. Primary yeah. role was a trainer. Uh, Reds used them. Uh, and then right, yeah. subsequently they took over the role on 100 Squadron, which is where I flew them for, for four and a half years. They took over a target facilities role. So uh, very simplistically, 
you get tornadoes and typhoons and stuff flying around and they've got to practice shooting another aircraft down. If you get two typhoons out, it's twice the money. And of course, per hour, they cost a lot of money. Whereas you get a hawk up, as well as a typhoon or a tornado F3 or whatever, it's it's cheaper. So we ended up, we set on targets. So we used to fly around at low level, at high level, whatever, pretending to be targets. So all the defense and various things could practice against us. Missile sites, radar sites, everything. So... Um, Oh, it was a great job. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I had Stephen Dalton on. Um, yeah, November last year, I remember him mentioning him. Uh, in fact, he's yeah, he's he's the only other, in fact, he's the only other RAF guy I've had on actually. Both pilots, bizarre. Mm. No RAF regiment yet. It's happening. It's happening though. Good. What's that little smirk? Yeah. <laughs> I <don't, laughs> I'm saying nothing more. Just because get attacked in the middle of the night somewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but no, I heard you mentioning in a uh, in a video I've seen you in the past, and it was I think you were dinner speaking, and you were mentioning about the the low level flying. I didn't realise you could go down to like sixty, seventy feet wartime, wartime. Um, yeah, that's one of the things about modern things. People film you and doing all these, you know, speaks speeches enough to, which is in some ways good, but in some ways it's like you know, everybody can see what you do. Then why would they buy you? But anyway, um, and also they didn't do it without asking permission. There you go. That's it's such a life nowadays. The modern way it goes. Um, Low level flying, yeah. Um, in peacetime, low level flying is 250 feet for the majority of us. In training, you start at 500 feet, drop down to 250 feet. And then for those that do ultra low flying in the old days, so they don't do it anymore nowadays, you can go down to 100, 100 feet. So 100 feet is 30 meters. It's nothing. It's nothing. Uh, 250 feet, it's 80 meters. And the best, the best way I can sort of, because visually people, 80 meters, but it's obviously you think about a 100 meter, you know, the... Usain Bolt can do that in like Forget the seven speed seconds. Involved, yeah. right? but, um, the, but if you take a rugby pitch, football pitch, hockey pitch and turn it on end, you fly underneath the top posts. That's that's People tend to visualise that quite clearly. And yeah, the normal speed for uh, low level is 420 knots. So, I mean, it's obviously nautical miles rather than statute miles, but just fudge it a bit. But it's seven miles a minute is, is the best way of looking at it. And you, you know, people, it's like anything people say, it goes really fast, which it is. And it's really low, which it is. I mean, I get people to say, you know, they, they were walking in the Lake Districts or, or in in Wales, and they saw a jet go in the valley underneath. They said you were really low, and I say well, that's because we are really low. <laughs> and the bit you talked about in in peacetime, I never went to uh, in um, in war. I never went to war, um, but obviously my colleagues and people that trained through me went and followed went onto the tornado and Jaguar that went to war in uh, Iraq. Um, yeah, basically. <laughs> The guys would call it. it. wasn't. There was no limit. It was basically a sphincter factor. That's, <laughs> you. You basically went as low as you felt you could go, and it was how far your bottom would let you go. Yeah. Basically, yeah. you know, I, you, you see some of the some of the official and unofficial videos coming back from uh, from when they're flying out there because they obviously practice and practice and they could rot around there. But flying in the desert when it's sometimes you can see the terrain, people. There's a lot of discussion about how do you fly, how do you do, it, how do you know what's around the corner, and of course. You know, we've got maps, we know what's happening, and we, we tend to know the terrain around here. But when you go and fly in the desert, you may just use a sort of a piece of sandpaper. And, uh, you know, some of the rocks and nothing's mapped. You know, they, they'll have no sort of topography laid out or whatever. Yeah. Nowadays, with, with satellite uh, imagery and that sort of stuff, it's probably going to be better. But in those days, they didn't have that. Yeah. I remember going in 03, and, and uh, the maps we were given were one in one million. <laughs> The scale was well. That's what which, we. That's what we probably for, great for you guys. Well, no, that's what we use for high level flying. <laughs> I mean, for for low level flying, use one 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 a quarter, one two fifty. So that's what we oh, use. Okay. For that. So that's that's the main flying map. Yeah. So, so on there, seven miles a minute. It's about an inch. Is about is about uh, one minute of flying. Um, and then when you do the target run, then you go and use an OS map. So one fifty. What was um so from a, uh, a mental resilience perspective? What was was it? Was there any measures in place with the RAF uh, to manage um, stress and um, well the, the the impact of like a high stress role such as a pilot, fast jet pilot? Um, is that is that annoying you? Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> you want it shoved around my face? So it's like can't it, can't it go that way? No, no, no. Up, up. Yeah, it. there you go. Yeah, different world. I just had a mask on. That's why <laughs> face mask. I just talk into it. Um, when I started, no, uh, there's nothing like that. It uh, it depended on your squadron, the people you spoke to, and that sort of stuff, which I think is no different to any discipline in the military. Um, 
but towards the end, I got involved uh, with crew resource management. With? Crew resource management, yeah. CRM. So it's human factors type stuff. Uh, and that's, that was very much looking at that sort of stuff. So part of the thing in there was about stress and that got brought in. So I was involved in um, running a course for air crew um, on H HF type stuff. Um, so no, I can't put it, human factors type stuff. Explain so. human factors, because I've only heard the term a couple of times in the last few years, and if I've only heard it a couple of times, then other people may not have heard it at all. Yeah. Well, human factors, pretty much as it states, it's, it's sort of factors that are affected you by, by the fact we're human. Uh, the best way to describe it is, uh, you know, why do we as humans make mistakes? Because we're human. You know, it's that whole scenario. But trying to understand a bit more underneath that, um, sort of veneer of that, which is very sort of sweeping statement, is how does it impact? And so one of the things that, that came out, the reason why uh, CRM was a, a term coined by uh, the commercial airlines. So back in the 70s and 80s, so you would even thought about them, um, they were, had lots of accidents and crashes in, this, in, the, in the civilian world. And as far as, you know, especially all the, the people uh, in, in the States, so United Airlines and Pan Am and all the, the, the airlines in those days, you know, they, they recruit the best pilots. They spend millions of pounds on training, and yet their pilots make mistakes. And so they did a big research with the NTSB, the um, uh, American uh, Transport Safety Board, uh, NASA, various people, at to the whole context. And what they found was that they were very good at training them how to be a pilot, but they recognized that they didn't actually train them how to be a human being as a pilot in that situation. So things like decision making, um, situation awareness, stress management, effective comms, all that sort of area was stuff that was sort of uh, SOP type stuff, but don't recognize the impact that having one person, never mind three person in a crew, and the impact that has. And you'll know in your world, in, you know, I don't even know what your background is from the point of view exactly what you did, but whether you talk about special forces, platoons, uh, people on a on a frigate or ship and they have to work together as teams. You get some good teams, you get some bad teams. You get one person that causes a problem. There's all that sort of stuff. And it's no different in the flying world. Um, and, you know, well, you can talk about that sort of stuff till, um, you know, uh, well, for the rest of the year. You still wouldn't cover half the subjects. And so, you know, uh, there was the um, Tenerife crash in the 70s. Tenerife used to be an, air, an airfield in between the volcanoes. It used to be notorious for getting fogged out all the time. They've moved it now, there's a new uh, airfield there. <coughs> but there are situations, only one runway, the, the um, taxiway was halfway down the runway. So when you landed, you had to backtrack before you could turn off. Another aircraft, another jumbo wanted to get airborne, it was late, communication was poor, went because he thought he had permission and you had jumbo just trying to take off and one trying to turn off and... So as you landed, you land your plane, you get to the end, you have to reverse at the runway essentially and then turn off. Not reverse, you turn around. Turn around. Yeah. There's lots of so you turn around <laughs> and backtrack. So obviously you're, you're, you're heading back into the way that traffic want to get airborne, either somebody landing or somebody wanted to take off. Mm. Um, that was a disaster. Three, four hundred people died. It's horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. You've got um, a TriStar, uh, I can't remember who it was now, but flying around in uh, the Everglades in Florida, put the undercarriage down to land. And we get greens, you have the expression three greens. So when the undercarriage go down, it's down and locked, so that the actual undercarriage is locked. So you don't want an undercarriage that's down, but it's not locked; it'll obviously collapse. So you're waiting for your three greens. You get three greens, you're happy. But they ended up with two greens and one no light. Now, they spent a long time trying to decide what was wrong with the light. Was it the undercarriage? They spent so much time as they were um, in a circular pattern uh, at 1,500 feet. They disengaged the autopilot by accident. They, I think, one of them knocked the um, uh, joystick and it disengaged. The, that's what they they reckon. And it went into a very slow descent. And even air traffic, by the time they realized that the um, uh, the transponder was showing that the height was going down and the air crew, they actually hit the ground. So things like that. It's like three very experienced air crew talking about 20 cent light bulb. And actually it's light bulb that's wrong, not the undercarriage, but caused the accident. So there's you know, a litany of that sort of stuff through not only just aviation, but all the things that are involved in humans. So all uh, anything to do with construction, um, uh, manufacturing, all that sort of stuff. Every little element of it has some form of human factors involved in it. That's where, you get, that's where foolproof comes from, right? The term foolproof, is, is, it's trying to mitigate against, against human factor it, impact. It is. One of my contentions is interesting because you don't have to be a fool to be able to do something. <coughs> Even there's a whole you know, get complacency, too over eager, trying to do your best. You know, you get lots of situations where people just, 
they're not they're doing it for the right reasons they just want to get the job done and finish it off and there's a can-do attitude but of course sometimes that gets you to rush and do things that you wouldn't normally do and you create a mistake um and it's fascinating so i find it really fascinating and i got so when i got involved in doing that crm training the whole human factor side of things i got really involved and so i'm not a psychologist i wouldn't even describe myself i'm a psychologist but i'm interested in that sort of stuff and trying to think about uh, how that impacts on the way we do what we do um, and it's relevant both from a um, flying as well as a, a sport point of view it's interesting I, I'm, I'm assuming you're very interested in it in the, the sort of the mental side of, of a variety of things because man it, dri- it drives our bodies right it's how we operate from a, and it's so interesting for myself from a personal perspective but also it's kind of, it's kind of about through trying to spot signs and symptoms of ill health in, in you know ex-colleagues um, <clears throat> but um, I try I look at from a from a like a team and a work perspective now one of the, one of the ways I sort of look at it especially with human factor side with with work and also in a you know looking after your mukerjee's environment is that we look at the, that that term foolproof right and and one of the ways through through health and safety and the health and, so the health and safety revolution of the last 20 years if you like or 20, 30 years it's become a it, one of the things they're trying in place to mitigate against the risk of human factor causing dramas is checklists and this and safeguards and all the rest of it um, where what I like about what seems to be the current situation, the way that um, the corporate world is moving forward, it's become very much more accepting of um, the the impact of mental well-being, not mental health, but mental well-being and, and stress on the workplace. Now that can impact productivity. And I look at it in a way that, in a similar way, to sort of the, the Israelis do, the Israelis piloted physical security. So back in the day when it, when uh, terrorism started hitting and the birth of it in, in Palestine and on the West Bank, and the Israelis, instead of, is, from an airport perspective, <clears throat> instead of a, a ring of steel around the airport and preventing suicide bombers getting in, they would have they would have layered security. So on the peripheries of the airport, like at the, where the roads are coming in, there are the barriers, they'd have, they'd have people there, and those people would be trained to look at Civ, civ pop coming in and, and spot sort of signs of stress and and then they would identify them early on so the chance to spot them earlier out were much better so it reduced the impact in the actual in the um in the airport and the bombs going off in there it's similar in terms of the workplace so, you know um spotting issues or or reducing the chance of issue two or three months ahead you know um uh like things like i don't know they got what stress 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 assessments now and, and 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 things like that and resilience building um, which is what obviously what wingman does that kind of thing right Resil- sort of yeah 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 um and i think <clears throat> it's a good thing moving forward it makes it totally makes the uk a more productive work more productive place i think potentially mm. i don't know um did it start coming in so it started coming in the, in the air force as you started leaving so just just because yeah, you, you you talked about a few things there you know um st- st- Awareness of stress is, is one thing. Being able to try to recognize it's a real challenge, as you mentioned before, with your colleagues and various things. And that's that's always a, an interesting challenge. And never mind recognizing yourself. That's always the, the last person that recognizes it. Um, but like anything else, you know, just bringing some training in stress, in stress awareness and whatever only takes it so far. There's still, you know, still, it's still part of a bigger picture, a bigger engine. And you mentioned before about, you know, bringing in checklists and bringing, you know. And I go back to foolproof. You know, any checklist um, process procedure is only as good as the person doing it. It doesn't make any difference. I get, you know, when I went to a I went to a seminar and they're talking about AI and could AI be something that sort of um, helps with it? Well, somebody still wrote the software for AI. Hmm. So, trying to avoid a human footprint at some point in any process, anywhere, is nigh impossible. And so, thereby, there's always something that potentially can go on. And you know, the number of people, as soon as something goes wrong, right, what can else we can chuck into the, into the um, checklist? And it goes back to, so this is before you talk about stress. This is talk about, you know, for me, stress and well-being is just one element of the whole bigger picture of how we do what we've got to do to make sure that we work well. Because if you just think of stress and just do stress on its own, well, there's other things you've got to get right. So for me, it's not, you know, it's all, people tend to, it's, what's the next latest fad? What's the next thing that we do? And it becomes compartmentalized there. We're actually part of it, and I think it devalues the, the whole context of it in some ways. So, yeah, why are they stressed in the first place? Well, because all this stuff is not right. Well, let's make them aware that they're stressed. Well, they know they're stressed. What they want to do is get rid of the stress ores. And so, how do you get all other stuff sorted out? Um, and so, 
a lot of the sort of changes that people are trying to bring in context of that whole scenario about, you know, let's bring a checklist to stop that. Well, yeah, the wonderful thing about us human beings, we're very, very devious at trying to work out how to overcome things. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I wouldn't tell you the sort of things. I mean, I've done 20 years of this. I've done 20 years of going to different places looking at this. And I, I get asked to go because I have a sort of a, a safety. I'm not a health and safety expert. I'm not osh kosh, all that sort of stuff. I've got no qualifications in that area. But in the context of human factors and linking into safety and talking to companies and businesses about uh, safety leadership and how the impact of the way you behave at the top has an impact on safety down at the bottom. I, there's no no names and factuals, obviously, for this. Either. I remember one, I was speaking to some of these senior, senior managers at this um, construction site. And, um, you know, what you've got to realise is that on a construction site, massive, huge thing, three, four hundred million pound thing, the Gantt chart they've got is like humongous. It fills the whole side of one hanger wall. And of course, everything's done uh, in just in time. So if somebody runs late, the knock-on effect isn't just everybody's on day late. It compounds itself. So what becomes one day late at the beginning will become weeks and months later further on down. And I go back to a lot of people, you know, there's all this thing about, I think that health and safety, especially, they're going to get the hard press. They just make it very simple guidelines. It's how people interpret how they use the rules for their own agenda. It's quite a sweeping statement, okay? Um, and so <laughs> they had a situation where it's on the weekend, these electrical guys, no, was they were coming to do something electric, I think it was electrics. And they, um, uh, it wasn't this fabrication or something like that. They had to come in and to finish off something to allow them to the next launch to start on the Monday. So these guys, off their own back, came in on the weekend, couldn't find the manager, so they went in, they'd worked there before, got into the compound to take this, this panel off the electric. They hadn't realized it had gone live since the last time they were in, because they hadn't had the, the brief and the checks and whatever. They took the panel off and happened to short it and they the two and they got flung across the compound into the into the um uh, when they climbed over the the um the fence to get into it go and do this quick job take them about an hour and finish go back done and uh anyway the alarms go off all hell breaks loose and i'm chatting to these senior managers discussing about it and so what happened next well this happened anyway. so, so what what did you guys do oh we're trying to find out what was going on you know who was at fault and what is this because we're waiting for the phone call all right well, what do you mean phone call well we know that the you know, duty director will be on the phone to us asking what the hell's going on. And of course, what do you want to know? What do you want to know whose fault it was? And as you as you learned, sort of, it went up to the director, the executives, to the chairman. Everybody was wanting to know what went on, whose fault was it? Was it our fault? Because obviously in the construction world, it's subcontractors, subcontractors, subcontractors. Um, and this whole thing was, whose fault was it? Is it our fault? And after, you know, God knows, half an hour, 45 minutes of this discussing what went on, how did you, what did you do and how they did that, I said, did anybody ask how they were? And there's a sheepish look at each other and went, oh, yeah, no. And so that behavior, which in some ways I understand, you know, whose fault is it? Is that our fault? Will we get the blame? Do we have to go and get the, the PR sorted out and get our spin put in before anybody starts throwing brickbats at us? What about the two guys? Are they all right? They were. They they massively shocked and bit you know cut some bruises, but that wasn't their mind. And so that drive. And so when you hear companies talking about safety as being their priority, well, you know what happens with priorities, don't you? <laughs> they change. And of course, when you talk about that balance between safety and business, and they talk about it being you know, anybody's not safe, stop. Yeah, try and get that down through a large organization, down through the layers when they're all under pressure to deliver and deliver against cost and against um, time. Yeah. And that pressure gets greater and greater all the way down. And then try and see if that's the balance is there. And that's that's half the challenge. And so you're talking about changing people's behaviors. So a lot of work that you're trying to do in the context of flying safety is not just stress, not just that technique or that... It's all of them together, but it's also about you understanding um, the way you do things, the behavior you use, and how you do it. So I'll give I'll give you a personal example. This is a personal example. This is you know no nobody came foul of it, but when I when I finished um, I was just finishing Valley, so I just finished on the Hawk. So I was learning to do my advanced flying training out of Valley, um, and as is you know I was finishing sort of September October time, but they wanted me to finish early August, so they could get me started on the next course, which is at Chivna at um, Barnstable to start the TAC weapons course. So that's so um, Hawks at, at Valley, at the end of which you got your wings, 
was teaching you to, to fly to an advanced stage. When you went to uh, Chivna, that's teaching you how to fight. So dropping bombs, firing guns, um, and flying tactically. And so they wanted to get me off there on the September course, because the September course finished at the uh, beginning of January, which meant I was finished in time to go and play in the Five Nations in the following year. Otherwise, I'd be down at Chivna while I was doing that going on. So they recognized it. So fine, you know. And so they, they accelerated me through the course, got flying, which is good for me, because, you know, when you do training, but you fly on a regular basis, you, you get better at it. If you don't fly as often, and you become rusty. Um, but the issue they had at... Um, at Valley to get me qualified to finish the course, you've got to be qualified not only day but night. Now, because the course finished in September, my course was sort of April to um, September, October, so you're through the some months. And they've got very strict rules at Valley because of holiday makers. And so between July and August, you can't, never mind night fly, you can't night fly at full stop. So there's no night flying at, Crum, at, uh, at Valley, which is fine. So got to the end, finished all my flying training. And I was sent off with a, a instructor down to um, uh, Broadie, down Haverford West, down in South Wales, South West Wales. And uh, there, the night flying, you can, but you've got to land by 12 o'clock. So I went off down to uh, Broadie with the, the instructor. We flew down the day, um, did a night sortie, dual, flew around, general area, landed, went to bed. Next day, day off, because you're night flying. Uh, I had some mates there, went um, uh, windsurfing, well, badly, falling all the time. <laughs> Uh, off the, the different coast down there and then uh, went back flying so the idea was that I'd go dual again fly around again happy then he sent me off solo and once I do my solo that's it me ticked and I'm off to Chivna so we come in uh, time going to the squadron it's peeing it down so weather's cack so weather's fine we can fly through the weather but we need sort of clear airspace to do our exercises so even if it's cloud based was high so there's a front coming through long story short got delayed so I see around the crew room waiting. Eventually the weather improves. We got airborne. But of course it just meant that everything got um, got pushed back. So the timeline got pushed back to the right. So we got airborne late. Did our stuff. Landed. Hot debrief in the aircraft as we're taxiing in. A few few major points, various bits and pieces. Uh, came and uh, handed the aircraft back to the engineers. Went to the um, crew room. Cup of coffee, tea. Grabbed a slice of toast as you do. Had a proper debrief. Chat about the next sortie. You're all happy. Okay, I think the jet should be ready. We need to go now. Go and sign off. And of course, the time was short because I had to get airborne again to get down before 12 o'clock. So by the time i done an hour flying, come back, hand the aircraft back in, get it serviced, running, for me to go and do ideally an hour was getting a bit tight. So eventually I thought, right, it's time to go. Sign the aircraft. Went down, went into the Lani's hut, and they're sort of looking at, oh, it's not ready yet, sir. Still waiting for the hydraulics to be done. All the fuel bowels are still out there filling up. It was late from, you know, the other side of the station or whatever. So, oh, hell, you know. Sooner I get later, the sooner I've got less time. So, long story short, after eventually they came in, signed all the all the um, the oxygen and fuel, oils, and all been done. I checked it was all done. Signed the aircraft, kind of my responsibility. Literally dragged my line in and ran out the um, uh, the, the line hut. The aircraft pulling out the blanks and plugs, chucked it out at him. Jumped in the aircraft, strapped me in. He's trying to pull away the steps. Eventually, I get the old canopy down. As soon as he's trying to get himself the uh, steps away, line to get up, and I'm starting the engines. I'm rattling through my checks, get the startings up, permission to taxi. Yes, off I go, R- down the taxiway, do my pre takeoff checks, line the runway, request takeoff. Yep, yeah, poof, up, relax. So I got airborne as soon as I could, went off into the local area. Uh, night flying, people sometimes find it quite strange for night flying. People think that you just fly in instruments at night, but you don't. It's, it's fantastic flying at night because you see all the lights. You can see, especially the moons out, you can see the horizon, you can see things. It's uh, Once your night's vision goes, you turn all the, the instruments down, it's all very red and, and stuff. Uh, and then you can see features, you can see the towns and various things. So you can actually navigate uh, from the ground, you know, line features, motorways or roads will have lights, showing lines and things. And so you're taught, you, you tend to, you don't do 100% visual, but you tend to do a, a mixture of the two. So it's like 50-50, whereas when it's beautiful sunshine day like you know, today, you'd be just looking outside all the time and just popping your head in every now and then. But it tends to be 50-50 as time when you're doing it at night, so you tend to fly around using visual cues and just check it every now and then. So we do all the exercises, doing some you know, turns and stalls and a few various things, and I came back into the circuit, flew a few circuits, and at 23, 59 and 59, last landing. Now the normal process is when you land, you've been strapped in, so I'm in an ejection seat in the Hawk, so I'm strapped in five-point harness. I've been in my, you know, all my, because it's, wait, it's still warm, so I have my flying suit, so I'm really hot and sweaty. So you want to get out the things. Now, you don't want to strap out the ejection seat when you've still got the seat live because obviously it potentially can go bang. 
So on the combing in front of the, uh, uh, above the instruments, you've got these two little plastic um, uh, flaps that stick down and there's a physical, so you push the pins into there from your seat and there's two pins, one on your seat pan handle and one on the side of the canopy, which is the MDC, which sets off the, um, smashes the canopy for you to go through. So there's two, so you put the flaps down and you push them both in. So as I reached up to it, even though it was dark and it was, um, you know, red lighting, I, I went to grab them and all I could see were these two flaps up and they were day glow orange. Now in the light it wasn't, but I could tell that they were there. These two big, they're only about half an inch, three quarters of an inch sort of square, two flaps staring at me. So they, And I suddenly looked at that and I went, shit, basically. Did you actually see admin live where you were flying? Correct. So if they're not there, there's only one place they are. They're still in my seat. And it's, all I can say is that, I mean, I'm 22. You know, it's the end of my, I've, I've just got my wings. I've just finished. I'm just about to go and do, you know. And um, this icicle just went straight down my spine. And it's one of the things I say to people, you know, it's like, it actually wasn't dangerous. It was the opposite. It was too safe. So it won't go bang. So, you know, if, if I had a problem, so the problem is it wasn't a problem itself, but if I had an engine failure and I was losing height and I couldn't restart it and I tried to eject and I was pulling handle wondering why it wouldn't go bang, and Mrs. Underwood was wondering why her son was still in the aircraft. Well, subsequent board of inquiry was saying, well, his pins were still in his seat. So I taxied in. Obviously, you can imagine sort of words that were being uttered rather loudly in my mask and whatever. <laughs> and obviously I got stra- unstrapped because there was no problem because my seat was still safe. And I was strapped and I was just thinking, what, uh, how, how, you know, I've done those checks God knows how many times. And in fact, there are two occasions where it tells you to take your pins out. So when you get in, strap in, Pre, pre-engine, you're supposed to check your pins because in case there's an engine fire when the engine's starting, you're supposed to be able to eject. And as you're taxing out, you're supposed to check your pins as well. So there's two occasions you check and yet they were still in there. And it's like this, you know. There's all a variety of things. I'm sure you've come across things in training where you think you've, you know, it all and suddenly you make a mistake. You think, how'd you, how'd you do that? It's, it's a very similar thing. Yeah. And um, I, was, I was just, you know, what, and I basically said, well, well, nobody knows. I won't tell anybody about it. So I told nobody about it. Came in, he said, how'd it go? Yeah, fine, no problem. Any problems out there, fine. It's landed in the time. Okay, well done. Back up next morning, flew back to Valley. Told nobody about it. So that was 1985. 1996, I then um, got posted to go and do this CRM. Um, 96. 96, yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> 11 years later, I got posted to go and um, do this HF, uh, Human Factors CRM course. And the whole context of it was about um, one of the challenges you've got is you only know there's anything gone wrong normally when there's a mishap. But anybody who knows the safety triangle will know that for any fatality to injuries, to incidents, to things, to anything, is huge. And so for one, there's like tens of thousands of things that go wrong which people actually don't realise or might do but don't realise it's bad. And of course, unless there's a smoking hole in the ground or a fatality, nobody investigates it. So there's actually a wealth of that information down the bottom. So the Air Force took on this uh, human factors open reporting. So we took on this whole thing about open reporting to being to admit to making mistakes um, for no other reason than, well, we want to find out why. So in the whole context of that, I thought it was an opposite you know, scenario to use from a personal perspective perspective to talk through that whole incident and use an example of an honest mistake that was made because various reasons we'll talk in a minute um such that anybody can learn from that as to well where could you break in that chain you know most things is the worst case scenario when you get two two uh things going wrong for me it had to be that too one engine failure of some description etc plus also uh on top of the fact that i left my pins in so um what I did with that, I used a very simple exercise where I gave a, a brief, it says, you know, uh, A4, written, I, a hawk pilot was, did, 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 and wrote it out, gave it to them, asked them to uh, put post notes on a board with regards to all the different elements that made up that story, <coughs> put a timeline, and then debate where at that was it, could it have been stopped, where it could have been avoided, et cetera, et cetera, which is just a fascinating debate because you could argue, it's always the, it's the start. Well, yeah, but these things happen, you know. There's a reason why you don't have night flying at Cramp at uh, Valley. There's a reason why they stop night flying at 12 o'clock at such and such. You know, whatever. At the end of the day, you know, I failed to do my checks. 
etc. So there's, it's a fascinating discussion. And so from their perspective, when they look at how you manage um, other people, how you manage safety, how you manage um, you know, quality, all that sort of stuff, it's a fascinating discussion to talk about where could this have been avoided. And of course, from my perspective, I, you know, I put myself on unlimited uh, pressure to get up airborne as good as possible. I rushed. It's as simple as that. I thought I was really good. The checks, because all I've done, you know, we all do it um, by memory. It's not, we don't have a checklist and physically read the checklist out. They're doing commercial. As fast check pilots, you just learn the, the checks off by heart. And of course, what happens is an element of complacency where you just mouth music as you go around. And so obviously I did the pins, but didn't actually physically do them. So in retrospect... What, how could you have pre 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 prevented that practically? Well, so what happened was when I obviously I didn't forget about it and never thought about it again. That particular day, as I was taxiing in, that night went into bed and I, didn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say I had nightmares and stress, but it obviously was going whizzing around my head. I said to myself, I can't let that happen again. So I, I, I devised, I just came up with some last chance checks. So every time before I got airborne, so literally before I get airborne, made sure I had permission to get airborne had the right flap settings, and my pins went. So before, I, as I was going on the runway, I just have a final check. That your critical stuff. Yeah. yeah, and the same with landing. So landing is always permission to land, three greens, um, and the runway's clear. Three greens your landing gear, right? Yeah, right. that's okay. it before. So three greens shows you the landing gear's down and locked. But as I, as I know, I use the same point. I said, and since then, it never happened again. But one of the famous, one of the things we have in the military, especially in the Air Force, is it, it'll never happen again until the next time because at the end of the day it's still people having to perform and if I get potentially put in the same pressure whatever. the thing about it is the whole context the home open reporting that we put into place was the fact that anybody could actually say that without fear of retribution so I, I put myself under pressure to do it but was I being negligent was I being you know um, trying to get uh, buy for somebody else or whatever was there any sort of reasons for doing it in a bad way no I was trying to get everyone as good as possible but I put myself under pressure so you know but you could have put yourself life under danger or if you had somebody else in the aircraft me life under danger yes you could have done but I didn't do it for any ultra, any reason than just being rushed and yet there are certain situations where you get in these sort of situations where somebody makes for want of a better description an honest mistake and yet sometimes in the current environment people are hauled through the coals backwards and yet what we're trying to provide is an environment where you own up to mistakes because, you know, uh, is, is it better for people to learn from your own mistake? Well, it's very effective, but it's not very efficient. So the example I give is, why do you not pick up a, a metal pot that's been boiling on the stove? Because you know it's hot and you'll burn your hands. So you use the old gloves. Well, if you didn't know that, you went and picked it up and you burn your hands. That's very effective at saying, don't pick up a hot stove because it's going to be burn your hands. But it's not very efficient because you're out of service for have along with burnt hands. What's very efficient and can be very effective is learning from other people's mistakes. As human beings, we're very, very minded to see when other people cock up. We like watching things where people trip over and stuff, but also we're always sucking in that information about, oh, didn't know that. I'm sure in your spiel, whatever your field was, whether it was use of tactics, use of machinery, use of certain uh, equipment, etc. And you, somebody said, da, 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 and this happened. And you went, did it? Why? Well, I didn't realize that. So, you know, using a certain temperature, this, this, this catch froze or whatever. You know, it's the same thing with, with that. So in, in, in flying, it's the very same, same scenario. So actually, you know, all that information you're missing out from the bottom end of the triangle was what we're trying to, uh, you know, bring out. Well, we're, t we're talking about, <coughs> it's fascinating, mate. <coughs> We're talking about honesty here on a baseline level. We're talking about in, 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 the, the benefits of honesty, right? Um, and so, my background, just in case anyone thinks that from what you're talking about as a chef or something, I was, I was in the Paris, I was in the mm. Paris, in three part. Um, and similar to yourself, uh, as, as time went on, uh, well, probably as time went on from you, and so when I served, so I served 21st century, 2011. Um, and it's something that I, I, when I left the military, I struggle when i went to the corporate world or commercial world i struggled and i struggled to cope with the different attitudes towards the honesty so i was brought up in inverted commas in the military on you mess you mess up you own up to that and you and it's, it's, a, it's a pride swallowing thing you swallow that pride and you own up to it because the benefit of other people learning from that lesson of your mistake if it was a mistake or whatever happened you know if it was a, a tactic that you were taught to adopt and that tactic didn't work 
and things went pear-shaped. You bring that up. Because the benefit of the wider organization is huge. But conversely, the impact on the wider organization if they don't learn that lesson can be catastrophic. Mm. As with um, as with being a pilot, it can result in loss of life. Uh, it can, and being honest, it can re- result in the winning of battles yeah. right, and campaigns in the yeah, yeah, picture. Yeah. And one of the things I, I, when I, so when I left the military, I went, in the private security world four years working in the Middle East. Very much the same environment, okay, military oriented. Yeah, yeah. When I came back to the UK, I went into health and safety, funny enough. So I got I got a background in health and safety. So I, a lot of what you're saying on that side resonates with me. I understand it in the human factor side. I really understand it. One of the things I couldn't understand is one, um, the resistance for people to be honest when they'd made a mistake mm-hmm. and pipe up about it. And two, the second one was for them to be held accountable for that by their bosses or by the management or even by the peer group when i say accountable i don't mean you're getting disciplined because that happened it's being accountable for getting that information out analyzing what went on and and using it for the benefit yeah. of the wider team and that that attitude from the honest uh, address things early on at, a, at, a, at that the bottom of the pyramid as you say man that can apply for anything from the corporate world to sports to military yeah, to yeah. relationship yeah. you know what i mean you don't address a, a thing that's annoying me with my girlfriend at day dot at day 100 if i've not addressed it that that's potentially us getting separated mm. because we just let it build them it's the same it's the same thing um now what we're talking about now with with the corporate commercial world is that sort of attitude seems to be changing it seems to be changing in the upper echelons but in and the sort of the 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 uh not work around sort of lower down lower down the ranks you get it's, it's still seems to be hard to change people's mind people got pride man and, and especially if then for just civilians have never been in a, in a military environment or a services environment where you got that attitude it's hard to get them to understand what the benefits are and it's hard to get them invested in the team or the organization they're part of they just don't have it within them i don't think it's, and it's that's not a criticism they're different they're different people like, yeah you know it's, 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 there's, uh, there's several things that come to mind when you when you when you're talking I mean, bear in mind that for those that go in the military, we are, we're selected and trained. So that's the first thing you've got to bear in mind. <coughs> so um, when you get your platoon commander, your regimental commander, or whoever, or your squadron boss, or your frigate captain, or whoever, when they get a new person join their ship, tank, cavalry, squadron, whatever, they know what they're getting. They know what they've been trained through. They know they've been trained. And there's an element of indoctrination, but I use it with a small eye. But they know what they're getting. Train the same way, think the same way, and all that sort of stuff. So the culture, the behavior, the skill sets, the everything. And, you know, as much as there's a lot of banter between the three services, you know, there is a lot of similarities between the way we do things. There's nuances, but fundamentally the same. And so to put yourself in a civilian world, how much of that is the same? How much similarity, how much indoctrination, how much training, how much, um, you know, schooling, college, university, MBA, whatever. Everybody that joins a business has gone it in a different way. So that's the first thing you've got to bear in mind. That's a good point. And that's why it's massively different. Um, the second thing is, um, from the point of view of business, and one of the things you've got to recognize is the whole context of why the entity is the way it is why is a military organization i always describe military organizations we're we're fundamentally a training organization all we do is train to go to war and if we're at war we're still training because the enemy adapts and we have to train and learn how to adapt with them you know blows up a vehicle well we'll make it stronger they realize they can't blow it up they make a bigger bomb so and you know the constant fight around that um and so you know that is a massive uh, part that plays in the whole context. It's a training organization. And I never so, thought of it like that, actually, yeah. I, I always think about it like that because I never went to war, but I spent a lot of time training and training other people to go to war. Um, and obviously the first instance when I was going through for my flying training to go to the tornado uh, before I before I chopped off the tornado course and went on the cameras um, was the whole predication towards potentially going to war. Now, I never joined the military to go to war, but I accepted that if the call came, I would go to war. So, you know, that's that's the part you have to, to accept. In a, in a civilian organization, there are a few more occasions nowadays, especially with the whole context of what you're talking about with stress and well-being stuff, where people try and run the businesses from. It's about how we work together and all that sort of, you know, good collaborative type ways of thinking. But at the end of the day, 
that only is successful if you make money. So we're getting very raw ingredients here. If that business does not make money, the business will go bust, you're out of a job. If the business doesn't make money, you can't earn the money you need to pay for your mortgage, your, school, <clears throat> your kids' school fees, uniforms, going on your holiday once a year, whatever. So the pressure on people in a civilian commercial world is a lot different. Yes, there is the, we put our lives on the line when we go and fly, the potential to die, and that's, just fun, and that, that's true. But fundamentally, when we do what we do, there's no monetary, monetary element into it. We're not trying to make a profit. All we're doing is spending budget. And that's one interesting skill set difference. You've got to understand the difference between going into a civilian world. Uh, and so one of the challenges you have for people like ourselves going into the, into the civilian world is that whole mindset shift difference. You know, the biggest thing that bugged me was not so much what, what you talked about. The biggest thing was like, people are late for meetings. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. People, people don't say, they, don't send me an email when they said they were going to send me. <laughs> now, see, the thing is our, our behavior, our mindset, you know, we have, we have 10 second time on targets. Down to 10 seconds and we're doing 420 miles an hour. You will have RVs at certain points. You'll be certain, you set your, um, all your stuff at certain We'd times. We'd have to get in the H hour because the air was coming in. Yeah, you, exactly. Yeah. yeah, we, you know, you'd set us one time ago and of course if we get it wrong or you get it wrong, well, there'll be friendly fire. So we know that there's life and, and to the extent, you know, I just try to explain to people, we're in that 10 second window. And if we can't get in that 10 second window, we do not go through it and do not drop a bomb. Yeah, but it's war. You should be dropping by. You don't go through there because there's somebody else going through there. And if you're both accurate, then you're going to clap hands over the top of the target. So you just go and just accept it for whatever reason. You swallow your pride. That's so important. So here, it's arbitrary. Yeah, 11 o'clock plus or minus 30 minutes is the sort of standard phrase. It's a great one in France. On Civic Street, they yeah. call it. They call it the Toulouse 15 minutes. So they're always 15 minutes late. <laughs> That's Toulouse for you. There you go. So, but those are the sort of things that, you know, I can remember the first time, you know, starting a business on my own, just leaving the Air Force. And you've got no understanding. I mean, I had no idea about proposals, writing things, what I should deliver, how much to cost, how much to charge. It's a whole, I mean, it's a I was massive. Ask. We can talk about the ladies, you know, but there's a whole massive thing. It's a massive learning curve. And a lot of it's just using your common sense and just go with your gut feel. Um, but that whole element of, I remember, you know, networking, uh, sales, how do you how do you sell one of your thing is to these people that will give you money you know it takes you a while to understand how that all works and um <laughs> i mean you know oh yeah yeah i'll get i'll get a, i'll get this email because the early stages of emails i started was it 2000 and, you know, 2000 2001 so they'll send me something next week and then two three weeks later it's like nothing comes through oh yeah yeah i forgot i'll send it through to you well and that took me a while to get i had to get my head around that big time i mean even now if I'm late for a meeting, I'll still, even I'm five minutes late, I've said, I'm, I'm on the way, I'm just a bit late, I'm just five minutes, just traffic or, you know, tube is late or whatever, but I'm coming just to let them know, even out of courtesy, that I'm late. It's something recently for me, <clears throat> and I mean the last couple of weeks, it's sort of a, <clears throat> got a lot of stresses in the background, and uh, and it's one of the things that, it's been gone for years, this is in the, a little niggle in the back of my head for years, and I, won't, I can't stand being late. I can't stand being late. Now, I am quite often late. I'm also often quite on time. <laughs> I can't stand being late. Sometimes it's my own fault, sometimes mm. others. But I, I've, I've now started last week, all right, last two weeks. So like, yeah, this is the time in. I'm, I'm working back from, from here, shower. That's my time at leave. Back, back, back. This is the time I get up. And I am going out the door. And even when my kids are involved, I'm going out the door at nine o'clock. If you're not with me, you're staying here. And I'm leaving at nine for my own sanity. I can't, because I, cause I, I can't stand it. <laughs> And it really helps, but I'm waffling now. Going back, transition. So uh, I completely, I completely understand where you're going to start a business. It's the naivety, no, the lack of knowledge uh, in when you leave. I think for myself, when I left, it's the, the lack of knowledge in what you're going into, but still the belief that you can, I can cut this. I'll learn as I go along. It doesn't. It's not quite as simple in Civic Street, especially I mean, when I started a business. Man, I didn't. I didn't understand the insurance side of things. Even just setting up, you know, just the company's house side of things. Didn't understand supply and demand. What makes a customer tick? Who is my customer? I didn't understand any of it. And I learned as I went along in the first business, which didn't survive. But I mean, that's one aspect. But in generally, the transition when you left the RAF, what was that like? How did you find it? Did um, I'm. <laughs> I, I always stress with my situation that I'm not necessarily the normal person that is a military person that leaves because of my rugby background. Mm. So that's it. I mean, 
you know, I did 18 years in, and um, most people done 18 years. If you've been married quarters and been uh, on detachments and whatever, you leave 18 years, you're very well indoctrinated. I, um, so I joined in 83, got married in 87. We lived off, off camp from 87. So for my last 14 years in the Air Force, I was in a house in Lincolnshire and driving to, to work. So I was virtually a nine to five type um, uh, person in the Royal Air Force. Did night flying, went away in detachments for weekends, but fundamentally it was turned up at Met Brief at eight o'clock and then when flying was finished, drove back home. So in the evenings, I'd go back to the wife and the house and the kids. So I never ended up being in that situation where I felt, you know, because I, I know, of, I mean, I remember on my squadron on 360, there's a guy who'd been in the military his whole life. He'd stayed on the camp. He was in officer's quarters his whole life, finished as a squadron leader, as a navigator. And he came to his, I think he eventually got to 60 and he was eventually, he was not going to be extended. He was, he was out. 60? Yeah. So not only 55, but you can get extended with specialist air crew and stuff like that. He got to 60 and he had no house. So he had to go and buy his first house and he lived, this was off Canberra. So he was like down in uh, St. Ives, Huntington, which is not cheap. And uh, he had to get his first mortgage at 60. And I can remember the stress he was put under because suddenly he had to pay this. And of course, you know, we enjoy the perks of being in the military and having subsidized uh, housing, uh, etc. And uh, that was a real, I can remember real. And I can remember when I first joined the squadron, there's others, you know, in the old days used to announce um, uh, the 1% rise in the base rate for the, you know, uh, mortgage like, why are people getting excited about it, you know? And people don't realize, I mean, cracky, you won't realize because you're too young. But I mean, Wendy and I bought our first house in, um, well, it's Wendy's house. We bought it in uh, 87, January 87. And by that summer, the mortgage rate went up to 14.75%. And so when people complain about it being 2 oh, yeah. or 2.5 now. <laughs> don't, Crazy. Don't think. Yeah. So, um, you know, that 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 was that's a real, real challenge. So, sorry, I digress a bit. You know, so the whole context of my background, I, when I, I literally, I, my last um, day in the Royal Air Force, uh, flying in my green bag, in a uh, Domini at uh, Cranwell. I finished on the, whatever day it was, because I, I left on my, my birthday, 18th. So I had like three, four months resettlement and um, leave and whatever bit. So I left in about February time or whatever it was. So whatever my last day was, I flew. You spend all days, you know, getting everything signed off, handing all your kit back that you've had for 18 years that you can't remember where it is and that sort of stuff. And, uh, and then the next day, I was sat at my desk in my study, in my shorts and you know, polo shirt, thinking, okay, what do I do now? Was there a plan? There was a plan. No, I mean, before that, before that exit, I mean, we're already, must, there was three of us that set up a, a team building company. So it was two Air Force, one Navy guy. So we'd, we'd done some work, we'd done some business, and we'd, um, uh, you know, done some uh, proposals, uh, delivered some work. So we already knew that there was a, uh, you know, suddenly we did this work and suddenly there was money in the bank. It was like, Oh, this is good stuff, isn't it? And stuff we enjoyed doing. So we knew there was that. And of course, then um, I was, uh, my colleague came out first. I was coming out second. So it was about a year, 18 months. And then my other guy from the Navy, he was leaving a year or two later. So actually, we agreed we wouldn't pay each other while we're in. So as we came out, it sort of allowed us to build the company up. And uh, so we started going. We ran that for about nine years. So in the grand scheme of things, I think it was a, it was a success. And we got to, uh, 2008 uh, then the crash happened mm -hmm. and you know all bets are off with regards to um, uh, the way the world was in that time so training went out the window you know money was down numbers going down so I just I, I, I took my own decision to to leave and set up my own company uh, be my own boss um, and that's what Wingman is now so from my perspective leaving I always sort of um, caveat my my thinking around that because I'm not like the normal military person leaving from just being military person to being civilian person you know as a military person yes I'm military I, some people say that you can tell that whatever um, but I lived off camp I, I'd go to some of all the Christmas draw and dining in nights but the rest of the time I wasn't beholden to the camp and everything on camp so I wasn't like your uh, stereotypical um, military sort of whole mindset mm. type issue. So 
one day I stopped wearing my green bag and the next day I was just in the civvies just doing work. It was not an issue for me. I, 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 I had no problems. It was not a stress thing for me or whatever, apart from people not responding to emails and <laughs> late for meetings and things. But there was, there was nothing like that in the context of my mindset and being stressed about it at all. And in fact, to be honest with you, it wasn't me, it was the missus. Because at the end of the day, you think about it, if you're in the military, you you know, there's there's cases scenarios with um, uh, redundancies that's been over the years. You know, even before your time and in my time, and then before my time, there's there's always a case where suddenly people get redundant. But basically, when you're in, you get a salary that hits your bank every month, guaranteed. Suddenly, you go and run your own business, and that money's not guaranteed. And a friend of mine said some wise words said to me because I remember because um, you know when I first left and started my business, my wife was concerned for obvious reasons. Um, and my friend of mine said to me, he said, look, mate, it's like this. You're on top of the parapet looking out of your, the world beyond. Wendy's at the bottom of the, on the ground in the castle, <coughs> behind the parapet. She can't see what you see. Which I thought was quite prophetic, mm. really. And so trying to make sure you communicate, understand what's going on, and make sure they feel comfortable because they want that security. It's interesting you mentioned about the job, the job security, what you talk about there. That, that was um, so when I left, I still had that. I think like going back, uh, you know, you talk about your guy who was 60, getting out, he's got no house. Now, other civilians listen to this, it's not just a major, majority of ex military or military listen to this podcast, but there's also civilians listen to it as well. And um, I mean, they're probably listening, going, What, what, what? like that career, and he hasn't even bothered to get a house. It's, it's hard to understand where that mindset comes from. I mean, you have to imagine, I'm, I'm like speaking this, Sip Pop, but don't really understand. It's like, when you're in, and you know this, Rory, when you're in, you don't have to do, in terms of look after yourself, you don't have to do anything. You get, from my perspective, when I joined up, it's like three square meals a day for free. Didn't have to pay for them, they for free. Take out your wage packet, which, as you said, comes every month. Come rain or shine, you get it regardless. You take your days off, you go sick, you don't lose your, if you go sick, you know, let's say you have a couple of weeks off because you got, a, I don't know, a, 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 an injury. You don't lose pay. Let's take it. Let's say you take four months off because you've broken a bone. You don't lose pay. Yep. It's army-wise, extremely difficult to get sacked. Extremely difficult to even get demoted. I mean, you know, it, it, it's the most job security you got, and you've got that, that indoctrination, that institutionalization. When you mentioned that guy who's sixty, do you know what I thought of? I thought of Brooks from Shawshank Redemption, the librarian who gets out and he goesn't talk to himself. He doesn't understand anything else. Mm. I'm not saying your man's going to do that. No, no, yeah, yeah. It's but. exactly the same type of thing. Everything's done for you. You don't even understand. When I got out, I didn't even really understand bills. I didn't understand rent. I didn't understand flipping life insurance because, I mean, life insurance to me was. We can wrap up in a bit. Life insurance to me was a. A bloke went to camp, walking into camp, and your platoon sergeant would come and go, Oi, we're going to Iraq next year, go and get, or six months, go and get your life insurance sorted. You go, yeah, okay, yeah. Son, you, go, you yeah. do it, you know? And you get out, and so it's not there anymore. And that, and when I realized the job security perspective when I left, that's what it was. Mm. I went into Civil Street, I had a job all the way through, and that first health and safety job, which was, I was told, was it was in Granite. I was the corporate health and safety manager for a not a small organization, landed on my feet with it. And uh, redundancy was being made in the first year that I, that I joined up because they split off. They were separating from a group of companies. You're all right, Hugh. No, don't be worried. No, no dramas, no dramas. And I was thinking, you don't, you don't sack the health and safety manager. You don't sack the health, especially when you've had a, uh, there's a guy died, actually. I think just off topic. A guy died in the UK going from business meeting to business meeting of dehydration. Died in his bed. A dehydration hotel in the UK. I couldn't believe it. I said, what's going on? Anyway. Anyway, I was on my watch, sorry. Yes. Anyway, um, and then I got me redundant and I was fuming because I'd been lied to by my manager. I'd been lied to by my manager. You know, I was like, Hang on a minute. I was absolutely at risk and you absolutely knew. Like, okay, that's what it goes. And then I realised, holy shit. I was in a super secure job, or I thought, and everything, everything was bullshit. Yeah. Where's my job security? And that was the one time I thought, oh my God, I wish I was back in the military yeah. because I've got a job. What was I doing? Why did I leave? And it changed the advice I, I was giving to people who were looking at leaving. It went from uh, just purely giving the advice on what I'm doing to go out, look, speak to this, think about this, but start your own business, do you want to do this, whatever, to do you really want to get out? Have you got something to go into? This is what you need to be aware of. And it was a job security chat. And it, I would now, even now say it, if I was you, I would stay in until you're absolutely 100% you're going to come out and you've got a plan. 
because if you haven't, it's going to be an absolute drama. And mm. I, again, different perspective from you, you know, especially um, pilot RAF. I mean, you have a completely different lifestyle. You different people. You're generally like a higher, more highly intelligent. You come from di- different backgrounds. You have got more life experience than what, for example, a private joined up with the military has. It's just, I mean, it's not a detriment, but I mean, it's just the way it is. Um, I, I agree with you to a certain extent, but one thing I would like to stress there, and it's the one thing, because I get asked to speak at, um, you know, we're doing it as a, just two mates just chatting away uh, over a pint. But when I get asked to go and speak at events where you've got businesses, you've got people thinking they're leaving the military, whatever. One of the things that military people are very, depends whether you're good or bad, we're very poor at realizing how good we are we don't really fully understand the skill sets that's been given to us. As I said, we're a training organization. Well, civilian world, training, pretty non-existent. So we spend 90% of our time training, civilian world, probably 10% of the time. So there's straight away. So even somebody who's just gone through basic training or been through officer training and then for whatever reason got chopped and ended up leaving, they've got a hell of a lot out of that. A lot of companies would pay a lot of money just for them to do that course anyway. So if anybody's done three years, seven years, 18 years or more, you've got an immense skill set. The real challenge is for you to understand how to understand what that skill set is and how best to use it in a civilian context. But the challenge I give not only to us leaving the military, and that's a, and so when you said before about, doesn't matter, I'm a pilot and I've got, you know, whatever, and I'm just a grunt and I just walk miles and shoot things. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> We've both been given a lot of skill sets, subtle differences of various things, but still, been both given it. and it doesn't make any difference which service you're in. The other thing is, for the businesses that are potentially looking at bringing ex-military people in, if they can work out how to harness that as well, the benefit both ways is massive. That's always been my message. It's a two-way thing. It's not just, you know, military, you've got to change. You know, because... I've had plenty of situations. I've got situations where I got uh, one guy who just retired recently. He was a um, health and safety in a big construction business, and he would own. He would, most of his people are hired. Most of his senior people are ex-military, especially Remy type stuff. It's construction, so it makes sense. Um, but then again, I come across people who says, "Oh yeah, I tried military people. God, didn't work. Nightmare." Because you get a military guy going and trying to be a military style to civilians, and it doesn't work. Yeah, you know, and we all both agree. There's lots of things in the military we're any good at, but there's also lots of things that we not so good at and especially in a, in a peace peace environment yeah i yeah. agree i i there has to be a <clears throat> we'll start wrapping it in a minute but we, we you're absolutely right mate there's a there's there's a balance to be had uh, an, a, a, a career like if i set up a company and i went right i'm only going to employ ex-military there it would be a disaster not because ex-military crap but because you for any team any organization you, your best bet of chance of succeeding and being efficient and productive is you want a diverse range of skill sets diverse range of backgrounds all x military isn't going to work because they're not going to be able to engage with the customer because customers sip pop isn't a really crude example and and the other way obviously all civilians works but as you were saying there's a benefit to be had from in, incorporating veterans in the organization for the things like you said even just like punctuality discipline you ask it to do something they're going to flip into it well that's, gonna... i mean i'll say to you that I, I get what you're saying about hiring just military but i'm in a mindset after time i'm quite happily hire ex-military people because i know that if you give them a job to do they'll just go away and do it if they can't they'll work out how to do it or they'll work out some options and come back and ask you about it but you know you get that they're fairly self-sufficient as ex-military guys that's that's the thing about it uh, yeah i think that's, i th- i I agree in some industries, I think other industries is not. It's, it's maybe it's, it, yeah, it's industry specific. If you're going to hire all ex-military. I mean, I mean, the organization, I work for in Marsat by day. And it's a, in the business that I'm in, I, I see it as a, like a, a really good example of a mix of veterans and civvies um, working together and, and this, and the ex- background experience and the attitude toward things crossing over. Yeah. Um, because you've got, uh, you've got quite a, f- you've got quite mostly, British um, Army and some Navy uh, working with a lot of a lot of um, civilians who are not just from UK, not just all male, female, all sorts. But so I've learned from from civilians working there is the sort of softer skills, the the more softly softly approach to in certain respects to just engaging on a personal level with colleagues, for example, or with a customer. 
And they're learning on the other side, I think, and they're learning on the other side from the importance of discipline, the importance of honesty, because we'll we make, have a problem. Like I said, we loan up and go, yeah, my issue, that I caused that drama. Well, that's, that's sort of leading by example. If you're more open to saying you've got a drama or created a drama or made a mistake, then they are too. It's a, re- it's a really interesting organisation way it works. Also, it's quite interesting. Cause the, 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 less, the less PC prone, you can get away with more dodgy jokes in the workplace. <laughs> <laughs> that's rubbing off as well um but no i i, I think it's it and coming around from that it, i think from veterans in 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 civil street and employ civilian employers being more keen on employing veterans i think that is coming forward um in, in a good way in a good way it's got it's, it's making progress but i'm talking shit yeah uh quality shit but yeah quality shit yeah thank you <laughs> thank you mate thank you <laughs> But let's start wrapping it up. I, I want to congratulate you, right? Because you've not, as an English r- Englishman, and the World Cup's coming up, and I have it all the time from you English. I'm Welsh, obviously, from you English people. You have not managed to mention England winning the World Cup in 2003 once. Once. In when? 73? 2003. 2003. 2003. Well, is congratulations that, on that. Is that all you get? The, what? People just mentioning 2003. That's well, you mentioned rugby and Wales beating England 16, and they go, oh, but we won the World Cup in 2003. 16, you haven't done it. 16 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> tell, tell me about it. Tell me about it. You played in three World Cups, didn't you? Yeah, 87, uh, 91, 95. 95 was South Africa? Yeah. How amazing was that? Well, I mean... Apart yeah, from the England result. That's, yeah. Well, we got to the semi-final. It was uh, the only bad game against uh, France in the, in the third, fourth playoff, but... You know, I was in uh, the, the week, the year before, uh, we toured South Africa. And so at Loft- Loftus Fairfield, we uh, we were introduced to um, the big man himself. I mean, you know. Oh, really? Yeah. Mandela? Him. Yeah, you didn't have a chance to have a conversation with him because he's literally on the pitch just being interviewed for the game. But, you know, I shook him by the hand. So that's one of the, uh, you know, proudest moments of seeing that. And seeing seeing that then burgeoning into what it was in 95 when mm. it all, now, we won't talk about the match itself and the, uh, just the, the New Zealanders were livid at the, the, the big dinner after the game, and they were absolutely livid. Anyway, but such is life. So, you know, it's going to be written in the stars that South Africa are going to win it. But um, you know, uh, and sadly, sad news this week. You know, Chester Williams mm-hmm. passed away. Yeah, it's very sad news. Uh, and he was the big. You know, yeah, uh, he was the only black man playing on the team at that time, yeah. wasn't he? And yeah. he came in as a as he came in as a injury dispensation. Did he really? Yeah, he was initially it wasn't because he was in, injured or something, but then. Somebody got red carded, and for some reason they could bring somebody in, so he came in. But uh, you know, he was the poster boy for uh, South African rugby for obvious reasons. Um, but yeah, as an experience, South Africa with Mandela just literally just a couple of years after being into into power and uh, and everything with Francois Pina, the big you know um, uh, African sort of uh, blonde pinup boy and everything. It's just you know fantastic. It really was. I've, I've just come back from Cape Town a couple of right. weeks back, and I was talking to them. Um, talking to a couple of guys out there and I said, on, on the flight out in Heathrow when I was waiting to go I decided I was going to watch my favourite rugby match of all time which isn't a Wales versus England result it was Japan versus South Africa in the last week it is my favourite it was my favourite match of all time I was going crazy watching it everyone loves an underdog right and I mentioned it out there and I said oh yeah on the way out I watched uh, I, know, I know you're going to hate it I watched the Japan South Africa match and the guy went we don't talk about that dear we don't mention that <laughs> Okay. I can imagine, but I mean, you know, there's there's an example. You got you know South Africa who've got quality players, but they just didn't play well as a team. And you had average players who had a great team spirit, great team camaraderie, and Jones got them hyped up and but organised how to beat them. And a bit of luck going their way, a bit of ball bouncing their way. But hey, you know who would you know anybody anybody who can remember watching that or just seeing the the last bits of it would. It's one of those memories in sport, isn't it? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Shameless plug opportunity. Anything you want to mention? Where do where can where can people find out about Wingman? Well, Wingman Wingman Limited to Ltd dot com. There's a website. We'll show you the way. You know, one of the interesting we talked about a little bit through the discussion we just had around teams and how we work and operate. And one thing is, you know, for you and I, we know that we couldn't be successful and do what we want to do in our military life if we couldn't rely on the way our team worked. Teamwork is technically red. You don't even question it. Um, and yet you go into the civilian world, into corporate world, and teamwork is, yeah, we'll go to the, go to the pub and get pissed. 
And it's like, yeah, that's that's sort of part of it, but you still got to be able to do all the technical bits and skill set as a team. You know, the similarities between you guys on patrol when you're on the you know either side and checking six and stuff is the way we fly. You know, it's the same thing. We got two aircraft side by side. We check each other six all the time. There's so many similarities in how you look after your you know, your brother's keeper. Um, and one of the things that I find when I go into business, my consultancy world, in the context of several things, either uh, improving management and leadership skills uh, from a practical perspective, as well as how do you get businesses to understand when you've got a lot of people working together, the more efficient and effective you can be is how those people work together. The more money you make and the less money you spend, and you can do more for less. So that's always been the biggest challenge. And the challenge you then have is, well, how do you measure it? You know, we knew it worked. We always do it. It's not even questioned. We just go and do all that, that teamwork stuff. And yet in the, in the civilian world, it's difficult to quantify. It's difficult yeah. to measure. And so it's sort of talked about and done. And so one of the things, you know, you talk about health and safety and some of the behavior stuff. It's so hard. How do you measure it? And all that behavior stuff is much harder to measure. It is measurable, but it's harder to do. So um, that's that's been my one of my sort of um, driving forces for the last uh, 20 years of how do I get business to understand that not only do the team have to work out how they work together from a commercial perspective, but are they work together as a cultural perspective? So both both the, both the business and the team bit together. And when you get that that bit together, it works. It tends to be just KPIs and objectives, or it tends to be a teamwork questionnaire. But actually, put those two things together, and get it right, and create the right environment. You know, uh, without mentioning for too long, but 2003, um, everybody talks about it. They got the right people. I mean, that team came together at the right time. You're like they were about six months a year, probably too old. Their best was the year before, but did enough to be able to win that uh, World Cup in uh, 2003. You bloody mentioned it. Go yeah. on. <laughs> but, but in the context of um, for that, you know, what what uh, Clive did very well was create the right environment where you got great players. I mean, who is England captain? You could have picked half that team to be an England captain because there's so many great lieutenants. And so you look at any teams from your uh, from the Welsh perspective, and you could have, you know, the Gareth Edwards, but then how many others could have been captain? And they were, but, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of them because that period had all that. But you, you know that like you can have six, seven captains, you can have six, seven best paras, best pilots, and you put them together, but don't they work together? Mm-hmm. It's a nightmare. Mm-hmm. It's an absolute nightmare. Mm-hmm. And yet, sometimes people don't get that. It's just as long as you hit your money, as long as you produce the, the profits, then that's all that matters. And that's what drives the civilian world. And of course, behaviours then just fall off that. And it goes back to the bit you are talking about before. So, I mean, Don, you got five, you got a few minutes? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, cool. Because right, I got... <laughs> Talk forever. Because, yeah, yeah. um, so here's a question for you with, uh, with how you pitch that to corporates and commercials and, and the senior management, right? Yeah, yeah. Is So you, you can't, you, I agree, you can't quantify it. You can't put it into numbers if you, if you do this. You know, you change the way you communicate this. And you so, can't, you yeah. Can't so if you can't quantify it, how do you how do you pitch it well, you to can, convince them? You can quantify it, but it's trying to get across to the benchmarking. Business. Yeah, you right. can quantify it to get people. So I, I, I flip around this. So are you a high performance organization? Yes. So how do you know? Well, because we achieve this, and we've got ten percent year on year growth. So okay, well, that tells me you're a successful from a business doing that. But how do I know that you've got a high performance? bunch of people in there how do i know that your teams are actually high performance how do i know that they're actually best ability well because i'm making this profit in 10 percent yes okay how do you know that the success of those teams is because of them working as teams or in spite of them working as teams mm. and nobody can answer that question now us in the military we know when it doesn't work and doesn't and whatever but in in the civilian world in the corporate world the very few people can do that and so what I'm talking about is if you can actually quantify that side of things around how that works and how it doesn't work and how you can improve that as well as the commerciality bit, well, so if, if you could find out that actually my team is operating at 75% and I could make it 80, which would mean uplift, would you like that? Yeah. Yes. So that's what I provide. Got it. Uh, to finish off, World Cup prediction. Um, I had a chat with the... Um, an Irish um, radio station yesterday and they were saying there was the tier one nations were South Africa, England and, and New Zealand and then Wales, Ireland and France were like tier two. I sort of... What? Yeah, I sort of... 
in some ways, in some ways, I agree with him. But I said that the real thing, the thing is that the gap between those two is like minuscule. And I think, you know, I was at uh, Cardiff when you beat us at uh, Cardiff in the second game when we played at your place, and uh, people were obviously helping me. Just it's okay, we won but England by three points, and we thrashed us last week. We won, so that's, we're up at the moment. So. But then, then there's the bemused looks around everybody else's face in the game. And also we're number one, even though yeah, New Zealand yeah. beat Australia by 36 <laughs> points to nil. And there's those scratching heads going, but who cares? We're number one and we beat England. And, and then, of course, then two weeks later, we played Ireland. And if Ireland had beaten us, they would have ended up being world number one. Now, without getting into the vagaries of the algorithmic formulas that they use for working it out over time, who they're playing against, the conditions and various things, what that says to me, actually, is that all those all those teams, including Australia and New Zealand and South Africa, are actually very closely lined mm -hmm. over the last six months. Hence, that, that's chopping and changing. So, to me, New Zealand probably slightly favourites, but there's a lot more close. I mean, New Zealand four years ago were head and shoulders. I mean, head and shoulders above everybody else. This time, probably just about top, you know, top of the you know I, I think i think absolutely say i think this is the closest i think th those those top Very teams open. are the closest yeah. they've been I mean, my, since i can remember yeah, yeah. so northern hemisphere and it's brilliant for rugby it's brilliant so, it, it, i'm looking for japan i really am looking for japan. i can't i can't go for a reason i can't get out there and, and watch um but i must be going to be fantastic and i think i agree with you and it's just going to be the bounce the ball uh, just don't get me started on yellow cards and red cards and just World Rugby trying to sort out a safer game and just going about the wrong way, but anyway, they go. Um, it's another whole chat another time. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, just the vagaries of that and just somebody getting red card and then banned for three games. And and the real challenge, the challenge for Wales and Ireland, so is it somebody said they thought the Irish squad was the strongest squad they've seen leave, and I'm thinking, I don't think so. They've still got a good first team, but they haven't got the strongest squad I've ever seen Ireland produce. Uh, I think probably the one four years ago was much stronger. Um, the problem with Wales, Ireland and Scotland to a lesser degree from the point of view of achieving is that on your day you can beat anybody but the problem is when you're playing a competition where you've got big games back to back week after week it's keeping bodies on the pitch and the one thing you look at is you look at the bench and you look at the England bench when it came on that is way better than you've got now I'm not decrying the, the bench for Ireland and Wales they're still good players but compared to you know, England, the one thing you see, you look at the 31 players that gone, any of those players you could see being in the test team. Would you say the same thing about the other two teams? Hmm. And of course, the bench. And that, just pretty simple from a practical point of view, when you get to the knockout stages, so you play your last game and then you've got to play three games back to back, four games back to back, and keeping bodies fit on the pitch and hopefully referees stop throwing cards around like confetti. That is the real challenge. And then obviously a bit of lady luck always helps. Prediction? Um, I, I, really, I mean, I'm not going to ask. Despite all the stuff you get asked about rugby leading up to, I've not been asked that one. Well, if in doubt, say your home country. Well, that's going to be the case. Um, <laughs> I really don't know. Uh, you know, it's it's like anything else. I think I think without a doubt, he's he's putting together a cracking squad. The sort of rugby they're playing. It's Eddie. Yeah, they've um, yes. There's a lot of physicality there, but there's also the physicality to create the space out wide because you know when you've got. Johnny May, Anthony Watson, you've still got a lot of pace on the wings. Um, so you get sucked in just to stop the Manners who are like, the Vunipolo brothers and all that lot trying to get through the middle. Well, you're going to leave gaps out wide. So it's going to be fascinating how it's, I, 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 you know, I've seen New, New Zealand and, and they'll, they'll still be competitive, but they're nowhere near as good as they were uh, four years ago at all. Mm -hmm. South Africa, I think, is a dark horse. Um, yeah, of course, each of us want to, our country, and of course, I'll say England. Um, whether they win it I don't know but I want us to do well so you get the semi-final and see where we go from there but uh, yeah, Japan first time it's not been in the tier one nation I'm looking forward to it cool so am I mate thank you very much for your time I really sure. appreciate it really thank appreciate you. it and um, should do it again sometime in the future after Wales win the World Cup Rory cheers buddy good luck cool <laughs>